three kinds of people that you meet in churches today. If there's a church there, you'll find these three people in that church. Now you listen as I read out the English Standard Version. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you're not ready to receive it. And even now you're not ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Let's pray. Lord, we know that you've given us this information in your scriptures, in your word to us. The Father, we might grow to be like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be discerning. We really want to know you. We want your spirit to speak to us through your word. Speak in our hearts. Open our minds that we might become like you. Lord, make us receptive to your word and to spiritual insight. Show us where we need to grow. And open our eyes to those who are around us who are blind to spiritual truth in its entirety. Lord, they really need to know the gospel message. Father, help us today as we study. Lord, help me as I preach. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You got the three types of people, right? There's the natural person. There's the fleshly believer. That's what I'm going to call them. And the spiritual believer. These three types are here. So let's start with the first and the, the rarest person to find in church. Now you'll find them in a church. And they're here this morning. There are some here this morning that fit this group. It's in verse 14. He talks about these folks. He says, uh, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it for only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. Now in the ESV, it, uses, it translates this as the natural person. It's using the Greek word psychos. And uh, Paul is using that word, he's highly, he's going to use a different word for each of these three. The ESV translates that as a natural person. Not a good translation. But then the others aren't much better. This word psychos, uh, it doesn't mean, for instance, psycho, like Freddy Krueger. It's going to sound that way. And it doesn't mean psycho, like uh, I think it's Sister Cleo. Somebody, when we were in Memphis, she was in California and she was making a lot of money. She was a psychic. It doesn't talk about that. It, it is talking about maybe a little bit like uh, psychology to talk about a person's psyche. But uh, this is a tough one. The, the, uh, the Net Bible translates this as unbelievers. It just goes straight. Here's what he's talking about, unbelievers. But that's not what the word means. That's who he's talking about. He's talking about unbelievers, people that don't have the Spirit. And then I need to say the person without the Spirit. And they don't have the Spirit because they are unbelievers. When you get saved, you get the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 talks about, we've all been baptized in the Spirit of God. Now that, that happens to you when you get saved. You are immersed in the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God places you into the body of Christ. You have everything God has available for you. It's there just for access it's there for use. God wants to work those in you. So you become a person who has the Spirit because the natural person, the unsaved person, the person who hasn't responded to the gospel, that person is totally disconnected from the Spirit of God. It's like that switch is off. And they're not receiving anything from the Spirit of God. If you tell them spiritual things, they're not going to get that. Now, some of these people are quote, spiritual. They believe in crystal skull. But these people are like, well, I've got a connection with this, this crystal ball or this crystal skull or this, this is how I have some spiritual. That's not spiritual. That's only spirituality. That's fake spirituality. The only true spirituality is when you're connected to the one spirit that creates us all, the spirit of God. You have that connection, then you're spiritual. Anthony Thistleton 
in his commentary says this, this word psychikos is used of a man whose motives do not rise above the level of merely human needs and aspirations. That's the best he could do, is to be as good of a human or a humanist or somebody that has a concern about things of this world. That's the best he could do because he has no spiritual connection. This is contrasted with a person who is spiritual. Chapter 15 and verse 44, he talks about, he contract, uses this word to contrast between the natural body and the spiritual body. He says in verse 44, they are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. There were people at Corinth in the church, Christians in the church, who were saying it's not possible that anybody can rise from the dead. They were disconnected from here to here. They weren't thinking, wait a minute, if you can't rise from the dead, how did Christ do it? And if Christ did it, then it's obviously impossible. They hadn't made that connection there. And Paul says that's ridiculous. There is a natural body that we have a physical body. When we are raised, we're going to have a spiritual body. It's going to be like a free floating spirit, just like a mist that goes near, right? No, it's going to be a body like Christ's body. It's not going to be a body that's going to die quickly and corrode. It's a body that will last for eternity. It will be a physical body you can touch like Christ's body was. Christ said, come feel me, come touch me. Give me something to eat, I'll eat, I'll show you that I can eat. I'm real. It's a real body, but it is not like these physical bodies. He talks about that also in the verse 46. What comes first is the natural body, the psychicos body, this body, the spiritual body, the pneumatic body comes later. Our present body is defined in the realms of physics and limited. We're limited by what we sometimes call the natural laws. We're using that idea, that concept. But James 3.15 tells us not only is this person natural instead of spiritual, he's confined to the physics instead of the spiritual realm, he also follows worldly wisdom. James says this, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. The word psychikos is translated in King James as sensual, meaning it only pertains to the realm of the physical world, the senses. There are some people who cannot get over their senses their understanding of the physical world, that they can't see how God could do something that doesn't fit the physical world. For instance, uh, when they look out of the physical world, they say it must have evolved, it has to be billions and billions of years old because light travels this far and you've got all of these things, a couple of all these scientists say, to say that this can't happen. Ignoring the fact that even involved in their physics is the idea that at one point, the world was about the whole universe was this big, and in the next second, it had expanded 100,000 light years. Well, how does something expand 100,000 light years in a second? And it takes 100,000 years to do it. Even their own theory doesn't work. But they have forgotten about the power of God who can speak things into existence. And they have ignored that. And so because it doesn't fit what they're able to work out in the physical world, they are saying that cannot be. They are following a worldly set of wisdom. It has to follow the rules that we know. It has to do things the way we think it ought to go, or the way our experience, our senses, our, our sight, our ears, our touch, our reasoning, this has to work this way. That's not it. The parallel word here is the word earthly. They're concerned only with the now, the present situation. You see, they don't really believe there's going to be an afterlife. They're only concerned with now. But he also gives us insight here in James and says their thoughts are also demonic. This is the source of this natural thinking. Don't believe what God said. God just wants to keep you from being wise. As wise as he is. And that's why he told you don't eat the fruit from the tree in the midst of the garden. God. 
You see, and the natural person says, yeah, God must be holding back. That's why Corinth was stirred up in his action. He didn't recognize that Paul and Peter and Apollos are not people to be followed in that sense or to have a preference. We're going to divide up. They're people to be followed as they follow Christ. They're, to be, they're here for your benefit. They're here so God can teach you things through them. And Jude 19 tells us that these unsaved people pretending to be Christians are the ones who are bringing about divisions in the church. And there are people who are unsaved in the church today. There are people who stand in pulpits that are unsaved. Uh, they're charlatans. These are following their natural instincts because, he knows what he says, they do not have God's spirit in them. They're unsaved. And that's what Paul's talking about there. Now, how do you help worldly-minded people who are in church on Sunday morning? They've not been born of the Spirit, and all they can think about is the natural or the physical world. Well, to ask the question is answered, right? They need the gospel. Now you say, well, who, who, is, who is the pastor? Well, some of our children. I mean, I, I don't want to alarm you, but you gave birth to natural people. Sinful people, people who don't have the Spirit of God. Until they come to know the Lord, until they hear the gospel, until the Spirit of God opens their heart and mind. Because remember, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. They don't get it. But when God opens up your heart and mind, you'll see it, you'll understand it. You'll recognize somebody's been telling you this about 12 or 14 times. Maybe a day, maybe through, but you have heard the gospel. You know, when I went forward in the service, I went forward to find out how you get saved. And I gave, was given a verse on assurance. I, it wasn't explained to me how you get saved. I went forward to find out how, and they didn't explain that to me. So one day, I was sitting on my bed trying to think, how am I going to get to heaven? And I thought, well, I knew we were Protestants. And there were Catholics. I didn't know any Catholics at that time. I went to a place where there weren't any Catholics much around. If they were there, I didn't know who they were in third grade. I'm thinking, well, there's Protestants and Catholics. I'll do both. And somewhere in there, if I do what everybody teaches, somewhere in there will be the thing that will save me. And that's when it dawned on me. That's when I had that moment of, oh, wait a minute, that wouldn't be trusting Christ alone. You see, when Christ died on the cross, God made salvation possible. When Christ raised him from the dead, when God raised Christ from the dead, he's declaring to us, this is the one, if you will trust in him alone, you'll be saved. Let me give you a verse from, first, uh, from John 16. Jesus says this, talking about the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. I think it's important for us to be telling people what God is telling. When you're sharing the gospel, when you're sharing about the death and resurrection of Christ, we talk about we're all sinners and we need to be saved. When you're presenting the gospel to somebody, you need to be saying to them what the Holy Spirit is saying to them. And the Holy Spirit is talking about three things. He's talking about sin and righteousness and judgment. And these things are very helpful back there how the Holy Spirit saves people. He says concerning sin because they don't believe in me. You want to have your sins forgiven, but you trust in Christ. Realize that's the only thing that's keeping you in sin and under the condemnation of sin is you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior. That's all you can do. They asked Jesus one day, what may we do? May we may work the works of God. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the one that he has sinned. That's all you can do. There's nothing you can do. Remember last week we were talking about the cross has done it all. Christ on the cross did it all. all if we want to have our sins forgiven, taken out of the way so they're not a barrier between us and God as they are right now, you have to put your trust in Christ that he's done, he's removed the penalty. 
Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Wait a minute. What? Well, you see, if Jesus wasn't righteous, we would be going to his shrine today and observing where the body was. So he was a good man. This is where he's buried. The prophet Jesus was buried here. And he wasn't righteous. But when God raised him from the dead, he was declaring, this one is righteous. He's going to live forever. He's showing you how to live forever. Righteousness, a right standing between you and God, a right personage between yourself and God is established because Jesus has risen from the dead. He died and paid for your sins. He rose from the dead. And then concerning judgment, what is it about judgment? Because the ruler of this world is judged. One who has blinded your mind to keep you from understanding spiritual things, to keep you wrapped up in physical interests, wants to keep you following him, but he is a doomed leader. He is a doomed character. If you keep on following Satan, you're going to get Satan's judgment. God did not send Jesus into this world so that you might continue on suffer that judgment. He did for just the opposite. He wants you to be saved. The ruler of this world was judged on the cross. His judgment was settled. It is only the carrying out of his sentence that's waiting. Now, that's the natural person. And they're amongst us today. Not just kids. Sometimes there's adults who have yet to put their trust in Christ as Savior. But the second type of person, actually it's the third type of person, I won't get you too confused, but rather than dealing with just the natural person and the spiritual person and then the fleshly person, let's get down to the fleshly person in, in verses 1 to 4 because that person is really like the natural person in so many ways. They're characterized, he used a different word here, the word sarkonos, which is the Greek word for flesh, sarks. So it comes from that. And from a practical standpoint, it's real hard to tell the difference between an unbeliever and a fleshly or carnal Christian because they live like the flesh. They live like the world. He says in 1 Corinthians 5, 1, he gives an example. He says, I can hardly believe the report about sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. That's carnality. That's somebody that's living for the flesh rather than living for God. How could a Christian do that? Well, the same way the believers in that day were not caring about eating meat sacrificed to idols, and, and that was causing other people to sin rather than becoming holy. They didn't care about that. I want it to have my stage. Same way that people would get up at a church meeting and speak in a foreign tongue and not care that no one knows what they're saying. And they were doing that because it was all about show. It wasn't about using their gifts to help others. One of the things that runs through this book is the desire to have others think you're spiritual. If there's a real problem in Corinth, that was the problem. They wanted everybody to think, I'm spiritual. And in the meantime, they were divided into factions they were disrupting the church service. Everybody was having to be number one. Everybody was having to do their thing. I want my thing. And they were simply doing it to please themselves. You know, there are people that will help other people, provided it makes them feel good to do that. But if it doesn't make them feel good, then this is not what I want to do. The fleshly Christian evaluates by worldly wisdom. He's not able to grasp what the Spirit is saying in the Bible because he doesn't study it. I'm not saying he doesn't read the Bible. But when he goes to the Bible, he reads the Bible looking for something to help him make a problem. I need something that works. I don't want to know what he was saying to those people. I want to know is there something in here I can grab out and use to make a point or to help me in business. The fleshly Christian brings about divisions. He splits up by personality or style rather than by using spiritual discernment. The fleshly Christian causes others to stumble. He's so intent on being spiritual, being seen to be spiritual, 
that he doesn't care that the unbeliever that walked in the back door thinks this whole bunch is nuts and turns and walks out the door without having the opportunity to hear the gospel and to be confronted because he's not concerned about it. How do you help that type of person? Well, Paul confronts them. That's the first Corinthians. He doesn't leave them alone. He talks about it. Even to the point of saying, next Sunday, when you guys get together, this guy who's living with his stepmother, put him out. Don't take a month-long process. Don't go to him in private. Don't do all you. You go ahead and you put him out. You have a boat. You put him out. I go with you as the apostle, as the founder, as your father in this church. I'm saying put him out. And apparently, they took a vote. The next Sunday, the majority voted to do that. Now, there was a minority that said, we, we need, but there was a majority that said, no, this guy's got to go. He can't be part of the church. And then Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he says, now, now that he's repented, bring him back in so that he doesn't get caught up in the things of Satan. So he says, and reassure him of your love. The reason we did this is because we love you. We don't want you to ruin your life and become a victim of Satan. He says you deal with that. Now let's get on to the person I really want to talk about the whole time. It's the spiritual person. Because that's what God wants all of us to be. For those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who has known the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. What's he saying? The spiritual person is the mature believer. He is the mature believer. He is the person who has the spirit, and the spirit has him. She has the spirit of God, and the spirit of God has her. They're listening for what the spirit of God is saying when they're hearing the word of God. They're looking for, is there something in my life that needs to change? Is there some perspective or attitude that I have that needs to change? What is the Spirit saying to me? What is the Spirit of God trying to teach me? Because let me tell you, every time the Word of God is preached, the Spirit of God is trying to speak. Every time you read the Bible, the Spirit of God is trying to speak to you. That's the mature believer. The mature believer, because he has the Spirit of God, is able to evaluate everybody. He understands the natural man because he once was a natural man. He can think like they think. He understands where they're thinking and why their thinking is wrong. Why they get tripped up over the resurrection. They're not getting, they don't understand it. And he knows why they don't. Because he knows the flaw in their thinking because he thought like a natural man at one point. But now that he has the spirit of God, he's able to see more. This is the person God wants every, listen to me, he wants every person in this room to become a spiritual person. There's a process, but he's wanting you to do that. He's wanting you to grow. He wants you to see ideas that are superior. Now, there's some people who say, you know, all truth is God's truth. And there is a point to that, but it's only the spiritual person it's able to determine what is true from what is what I think is true. You see, the spiritual person is able to discern God's truth from that which the world thinks is true. And he's able to do that. It comes because he has spirit-revealed wisdom. Verse 10, but it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. You see, it's a supernatural work of the Spirit to take the Word of God, to open your eyes, to put it in there, and to show you how it goes together so you can understand the truth of God. It takes the Spirit of God to put forth the gospel of Christ's death and resurrection and make it make sense to me. Because the Jews find it offensive. It's a stumbling block to them because it gives them nothing to do be saved except trust Christ. And to the Gentile, it appears foolishness because that couldn't be how anybody improved their life. How make it doesn't make any sense. But to the spiritual person, you recognize, oh yeah, that's how it had to be. It was God working these things out. They will understand that. 
What do you do with a spiritual person? How do you help them? Well, they're going to be focused on helping other people to misquote Jesus, which is a really dangerous thing to do. But uh, when Lazarus, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, and the old King James said, loose him and let him go. What do you do with a spiritual person? You turn them loose and say, serve the Lord. They say, yeah, that's what I want to do. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be encouraging the people. I'm going to be teaching people. I'm going to be exhorting some people. I'm going to get on people's case. I'm going to spread the gospel to people. I'm going to be discerning. I'm going to use all that I've got to minister to people. And they will help the church. And they're the only people that are going to be of any help to any church. For those who are walking in the spirit. Let me remind you of two things as we close. How does this help us deal with division church? Remember last week? This is from last week. It builds. We all meet at the cross. If you're here this morning and you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you humble yourself at the cross and say, I am a sinner and I cannot save myself. And the only reason I'm in this church is because God saves sinners. Not because I'm better than this sinner over here or that sinner over here. It's because we're all sinners. And the only thing that helped us, the only thing that could help us, the only thing that's given us everything we have is the cross of Jesus Christ. It brings us down to that level. No place for me to judge you or you to judge me. It's a place to say we're all sinners and we've got everything we have from the cross. Number one, this week, we have the mind of Christ. Now I'm going to read verses 6 to 16 the spiritual people and I want you to listen and I want you to hear what God is saying I'm just going to read it and then I'm going to be done but now that you know what a spiritual person is I want you to listen and let the spirit of God speak to you Paul says yet when I'm among mature believers I speak with words of wisdom but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to the world or the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom, no, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. For the hand, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That's what the scriptures mean when they say. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the spirit, using the spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach Him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. Father, as we come before you today, not in any pride. We know, Lord, there's nothing we have that Christ did not purchase for us on the cross. We have it because you have given it to us through him. We have it because you've given your spirit that we can read your word and understand what you're saying. Oh, we thank you so much for that. Lord, we're humbled by how much we don't know how much we don't live out what we do know. Lord, you've done such a wonderful thing in giving us your spirit. 
giving us everything that we need for life and godliness. And yet, Father, we often walk our own way instead of walking in your spirit. But help us to do what you're teaching us to do in your word. That we might live and grow and be spiritual people together. We ask this in Christ's name.